Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. As we're set to liberate the latest developments here in Israel throughout the region and beyond, with chief focus, of course, on the Lebanese front, it's always important to remember how the war began. 354 days ago, the Islamist Hamas and its terror affiliates in the Gaza Strip launched an onslaught on southern Israel, declaring war by perpetrating a massacre, murdering some 1,200 mostly civilians, wounding over 4,800 others, and kidnapping 246 people, including elderly men, women, children, and infants, 101 of them who remain in Hamas captivity to date. The subsequent day, on October 8th of last year, Iran essentially joined the war when it greenlighted its proxy in Lebanon, Hezbollah, to launch cross-border attacks against Israel. Since then, Hezbollah has launched roughly 7,000 projectiles towards Israeli territory, and not only Hezbollah, but additional Iranian proxies throughout the region, including from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, including Iran proper, on the night between the 13th and 14th of April earlier this year. Let's now turn to our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, Israel has gone into a new stage in its escalation dominance vis a vis Hezbollah, and it will no longer launch limited strikes as a tit-for-tat equation, but rather go on the offensive. Uh, that's right. Um, what we have now uh, is obviously not uh, only the Gaza war. It is no longer the Gaza war. It is the Gaza-Lebanon war, which Israel has been conducting for almost a year. And uh, as always, there is a main front and a secondary front. And um, we have seen a shift from Gaza as the main front to Lebanon. And Lebanon, of course, means uh, Hezbollah. Now, what the uh, IDF uh, has done in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut and elsewhere, in South Lebanon uh, mostly, over the last uh, week can be divided uh, into two complementary parts. One part um, is uh, the uh, vast amount of uh, strikes, mostly Air Force sorties, on various parts of the Hezbollah arsenal, um, on launchers, in private homes, everywhere, um, in uh, so-called nature reserves, uh, which is really uh, Hezbollah trying to hide their assets uh, among uh, uh, trees or um, behind uh, boulders, as the case may be in uh, mountainous parts of Lebanon. And uh, the IDF, especially the IAF, uh, has been very successful in uh, uh, conducting hundreds of sorties and uh, almost 2,000 attacks because strikes, because uh, each sortie can, of course, comprise of more than one strike. The other part, is the so-called targeted killings or targeted strikes on key officials, mostly officers, commanders of uh, various units of uh, Hezbollah. This has been done uh, in the Dahya, the southern suburb of Beirut, where um, many Shiites uh, reside, and also where Nasrallah, the secretary general of Hezbollah and his associates, have found refuge. So for the second day running, the uh, Israeli Air Force uh, has found and perhaps wounded or even killed a, a key officer. Yesterday it was Ali Karaki, the commander of the uh, Southern Front uh, on Hezbollah, of Hezbollah. It is not clear yet whether he was uh, wounded or killed or escaped injury altogether. And today it was Ibrahim Kubaisi who is the head of the uh, missile units for Hezbollah. Indeed. Let's now turn to central Israel, where we're joined by the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Missile Defense, namely Brigadier General and Reserve, Doron Gavish. It's good to see you, General. I'd like to immediately ask you uh, about uh, the IDF on the offensive and defensive. What are the figures that you can uh, give us over the last 24 hours alone? 
Well, uh, Jonathan, in the last uh, 24 hours, uh, we are talking about uh, around uh, uh, hundreds of uh, authorities and, uh, of course, uh, close to 2,000, uh, one, 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 uh, 1,800, basically. This is the exact uh, number of uh, authorities. Uh, we are here have an advantage because Lebanon is uh, close to Israel, so every Air Force uh, plane uh, could, could uh, strike more than uh, once, and they could come one after the other. So those are those are the, this is the reason why the strikes are are so uh, massive. Basically, Israel is attacking first the chain of command, and this is what we have seen uh, in the Dachia today and in the last uh, in the last days. Here we have to uh, mention that the strikes on the Dachia are very accurate ones. Uh, for example, today there was one or maybe two people that were killed, but that's it, uh, because Israel is very careful in order to make sure that the collateral damage is the minimum as uh, we can, but still we strike the commanders and the chain of command, and this is very important. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and Amir said it, is the, other, the arsenal itself of the missiles, uh, the rockets, uh, the cruise missiles, uh, we have uh, to say, uh, the third thing is the terrorists themselves. There is a large uh, amount of uh, terrorists that were heard du during the last uh, weeks. A week, sorry, we are talking about uh, uh, thousands uh, of them. Uh, so overall, together, there is a effect which is a, a strong one uh, over the Hezbollah. And we have to say that we are not using the full force of the Israeli Air Force yet. There is a, a still a way to go. Uh, the other thing which is super important to emphasize that if Israel is striking a house in the south part of uh, Lebanon or in the Baka, uh, again and again we ask the people that lived in this house to evacuate uh, the house. And the reason that we are attacking it is because there is uh, uh, ammunition inside this house and some of them even cruise missiles but it could be rockets or other explosives. Those are the only targets that are being uh, striked by the Israeli Air Force. And this is very important uh, to emphasize it because the, we see the pictures uh, of uh, people which are going uh, toward the, the northern part of, uh, of uh, Lebanon. And we see the narrative that is trying to be uh, shown by uh, our, uh, let's say, those that are not supporting us that, Israel is striking everyone. No, we're not. We are not. We are striking only those uh, that uh, they have ammunition in their houses. The other thing that I would like to mention, this is also very important. You said it right. Israel is now on the offensive in the in the Lebanon uh, arena. We talked about uh, the the idea of offensive, alert, active defense, passive defense, but the, we're we're saying offensive but we have to remember that this is a defensive act. The reason that Israel did it is because in the last 10 months, there were more than 7,000 rockets that were shot out Israel, other projectors, UAVs, uh, missiles, uh, anti-tank missiles, uh, people that were killed, uh, tens of them that were killed inside uh, Israel. And this is the reason, and of course, uh, more than 60 thousand uh, people that were evacuated from their house. The northern part of Israel is being shot. So we waited for a long, long time until we moved to this uh, uh, attack. But it is not Israel that started it. This is a defensive uh, um, uh, operation. And this is very important to, to emphasize uh, at that point. Thank you, General Gavish. Uh, you know, one of the things that amazes me every time, and that's one of the reasons that over the last uh, 354 days, we've been citing uh, on a near daily basis uh, the way this war has begun, because this past year has truly shown the face of so many individuals across the world spouting disinformation, rewriting history on an absurd level, uh, providing figures that have nothing to do with reality and also indicating, uh, you know, uh, the number of self-proclaimed experts for international law, for the Geneva Convention, for all those different 
uh, documents who have not even read those documents and have no applicability in, in any uh, aspect are just astounding. Uh, and uh, let alone the people who are uh, time and again coming out and saying about a precision strike or a precision maneuver, uh, dubbing it as indiscriminate. I mean, some people are, or the majority of people uh, these days, unfortunately, are in dire need of education uh, to really understand what each word means. But uh, let's turn to Washington, D.C., where we're joined by uh, Zineb Ribot, a uh, research fellow and manager of the uh, Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at Hudson Institute. It's good to see you, Zineb. Uh, and I'd like to immediately... It's always a pleasure, Zineb. Uh, I'd like to immediately ask you particularly about the uh, discourse in the Arab world. How are they looking, particularly the moderate Arab camp uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, and elsewhere, with regard to the latest activities vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, an Iranian proxy, which the majority of those countries regard as a terrorist organization? Well, um, I, I think it's it's clear today that Arab countries are seeing the operations of Israel as Israel restoring deterrence in the Middle East, uh, which uh, has been absent these last three, uh, four years. Um, this is uh, huge because it means that that uh, that deterring Hezbollah, deterring Hamas means that for Saudi Arabia it might go well since it might deter the Houthis as well. Uh, so I think this deterrence uh, uh, side of things is very important for Arab countries. Uh, let's not forget that there is also um, a civil war in Sudan that there is going to be probably uh, a conflict an escalation in Ethiopia and Somalia, uh, and so we're restoring every single, um, restoring the deterrence in every single front is actually important to restore stability in the region, since every single country is suffering from the blockade in the Red Sea, but also is suffering from um, um, uh, the uh, the outcomes of Hamas's attacks, uh, since not, not only they stopped uh, and uh, put on hold normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, but they've also uh, slowed down all of the agreements, negotiations, and even partnerships that the Abraham Accords uh, have started. Uh, so this is very important for um, for Arab countries to have Israel uh, restore some kind of deterrence. Of course, uh, I do think that they still see uh, the Palestine issue as, as central. Um, but it's it, but I would say that um, for now, it's really Iran that is dominating all the issue uh, and all the discourse regarding Gaza. Um, it's there is a huge shift. Um, that I've seen these last five years when it comes to that, that uh, actually Iran has political aims uh, when it comes to pressuring Israel, and um, and I would add that uh, one of the one of the biggest ones today is that Israel restored deterrence um, uh, so rapidly and uh, in a very sophisticated way through sabotage operations and through through other operations that um, um, that others have mentioned uh, that Iran is also even afraid now that they want to restore and to have uh, negotiate negotiations regarding. Uh, a, a nuclear deal. Uh, they are trying to um, to to get as much as they can uh, before Israel completely uh, shifts, for example, its operations and uh, and, and also targets uh, uh, Iranian nuclear facilities, since it's also considered a, a national security threat for Israel. Absolutely, it's important to highlight that. Also, the conflict in Sudan, Iran is heavily involved, of course. Uh, the conflict uh, between uh, Ethiopia and Somalia, of course, this is very low intensity, and there are moves and counter moves right now with the Egyptians involved, with Turkey involved, with uh, other nations involved. But Iran is also a central piece as one of the largest backers, of course, and uh, having a very significant stake in uh, the Al-Shabaab uh, terror group, alongside also with supporting uh, activities against the Somali government, particularly in the hope that Al-Shabaab may indeed uh, gain uh, once again power over the entire country. Uh, but we will touch uh, base on that maybe more later. Mr. Owen, uh, a very interesting discussion we had this morning after I received a tip with uh, 
uh, from U.S. intelligence that uh, the United States intelligence believes that Yahya Sinwar, the leader of the Islamist Hamas, is in fact killed in a targeted killing uh, roughly two weeks ago, I would say. Uh, what can you tell us about that and what does the Israeli intelligence believe about that where there are conflicting positions in there? So um, over uh, Yahya Sinwar's head, uh, there lies a virtual poster, Wild West uh, style, wanted dead or alive. And the question right now is indeed, is he dead or alive? He has not been heard from uh, for some time. Obviously, uh, he is uh, conducting uh, many security measures. He knows that uh, he cannot communicate electronically for fear of being under surveillance. And that hampers uh, all uh, forms of uh, discussions with him, even within his own group, um, because uh, the entire uh, negotiation uh, round or rounds uh, have been um, uh, conducted through intermediaries, sometimes uh, several layers of uh, intermediaries. And uh, by the way, he uh, uh, obviously remembers that uh, Osama bin Laden was finally found because the courier who brought him uh, messages and took messages from him uh, has been uh, spotted. So regarding the um, debate within the intelligence communities of Israel, the United States, um, and other uh, friendly Western services, it turns out that um, um, after 1973, you may remember, um, Israel has tried more pluralism in its intelligence community, hearing more than one opinion. And the result is that there are two opposing schools of thought regarding the whereabouts of uh, Sinwar. Um, without getting uh, into uh, too much uh, information regarding who said uh, what to whom, the minority view in one part of the community is that Sinwar is dead, and uh, this is the reason uh, he is not responding. Uh, in the same uh, branch of the community, the majority view is that uh, he is alive, but uh, may uh, uh, not wish to communicate right now, or may be uh, unable to, uh, temporarily, and this is the view also uh, held by other branches of the community. So to sum it up, yes, there are analysts who believe that Sinwar is dead, but uh, there are others, uh, more numerous and um, uh, quality-wise, uh, uh, no less uh, knowledgeable, who believe that Sinwar is uh, still alive. And if one may add to that, this specifically, um, this equation, though, Mr. Owen, you're speaking about the Israeli intelligence community as opposed to the American. Yes, of course. Yes, and yes, it, of course. Now, regarding his counterpart, uh, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, he has been too arrogant and too complacent because for 11 months, his gamble, uh, as you said, starting on October the 8th, uh, seemed uh, to be paying off. There was a war of attrition. And Israel was preoccupied with Gaza. But uh, in the Middle East, nothing is permanent. Everything is reversible. And uh, much like uh, Nasrallah said in 2006, that he regretted the fact that uh, he initiated the abduction of soldiers which started the campaign that summer. If he lives uh, to uh, regret what happened uh, last week and uh, st is still going on, he may echo it. Indeed. Well, uh, General Kavish, I'd like to ask you, since ultimately when we're talking about the Lebanese front where there is a high intensity war currently taking place with clear parameters, if I may add, Israel is not necessarily striking beyond the Litani River within the scope of 1701, as we have mentioned time and again, uh, other than targeted killings of senior Hezbollah operatives and commanders, 
who may be hiding within the Dahia neighborhood of the capital Beirut, something that, of course, is very limited in scope. Nevertheless, the fire rate and scope of targets within the, the allotted territory has been increasingly intensifying over the course of the last week alone. And uh, Hezbollah, on the other hand, is launching plenty of uh, rockets and uh, missiles, unmanned aerial vehicles towards various communities and targets in Israel, up to also within the scope of northern Israel, it has yet to breach that territory. And therefore, there are remaining certain constraints here that have also to do with external pressures uh, from the United States, from elsewhere. Nonetheless, we do see also additional Iranian proxies coming to the aid of Hezbollah with the Iraqis. Hash be launching a couple of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles time and again in order to show uh, somehow that they are involved, even though it's very limited. Is Israel still prepared for all fronts simultaneously? Well, this is a very important uh, point, Jonathan, because uh, we cannot uh, say for sure the, the preparedness uh, uh, part uh, only looking uh, to the north. Uh, we still have to remember that this is a multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral uh, uh, war, and the threats are uh, from Iraq, from Iran, from Iraq, from Yemen, from the Gaza Strip, and uh, and also from the West Bank, and uh, and of course from uh, from Lebanon, and uh, we also have been struck uh, from the sea. So 360 degrees, and this is what uh, Israel is uh, preparing uh, itself. If I if I may add to uh, to what was just uh, mentioned uh, by Amir. Uh, Israel uh, checked uh, two bodies that uh, it was suspected that uh, Sinwar is one of them. Uh, unfortunately, it was not one of them, so it could not be confirmed. Uh, so still uh, to be checked. And also I would like to refer to what was uh, mentioned by Zineb, because I think she brought up a very important point, and this is the deterrence uh, of Israel. Uh, one of the main goals, it's not the one that is being discussed openly, uh, of uh, the way that Israel is acting is also to bring back the, the deterrence. And, uh, you know, it's very uh, hard to know if the deterrence is there, yes or no. Uh, but until this point, we see that uh, the proxies, and you talked about uh, Syria and Iraq, uh, not the, the countries themselves, uh, the the uh, the the, the Iranian proxies which are there, but we're talking about one UAV that was shot from Syria, one UAV that was shot from uh, Iraq, none from uh, Yemen. The Iranians are not uh, moving yet from a military point of view, and the Hezbollah is being striked very, very hard. So it's a question mark if, uh, if the reason of it is the deterrence, but it could be. And this is a very important point uh, that Israel would bring back it uh, deters. Uh, I think that this is something that uh, all of us uh, in the West world, uh, we should look towards the, those terrorist organizations. And the way to bring back the deterrence is unfortunately with them not to stay on the defense, at some point to go in the offense in such a way that uh, they would be a deter, i.e. the Houthis in the, uh, uh, in the south, uh, south uh, east uh, to Israel. A very important point indeed, uh, Ms. Zineb. Uh, when we're talking about uh, Saudi Arabia, which you referred to earlier, uh, up until uh, the early stages of the Biden administration back in 2021, uh, there was the Saudi-led coalition against the Houthis. Of course, that was abruptly ended when the United States ended support for this coalition as well as the sale of offensive weaponry, uh, now that the Biden administration resumed uh, these uh, sales of offensive weaponry and pledged support for Saudi Arabia in the event that it is attacked, uh, do you see a reason for Saudi Arabia to once again reinvigorate its campaign against the Houthis in Yemen to root out this Iranian proxy from its backyard? I would say it's very unclear uh, because Saudi Arabia is adjusting its policy based on uh, U.S. foreign policy priorities. Um, 
when, for example, uh, the United States, because uh, yeah, the, the Saudis see the United States as, a, as an important partner in the Middle East uh, in, in different angles. And so, for example, when, um, when the Biden administration took the Houthis off the terrorist list, when they announced that Iran should be part of a regional integration type of strategy, um, I think for uh, for Saudi Arabia, they saw it as okay. Maybe it's time to normalize with Iran, and this is what they have done uh, through Beijing. Uh, and so uh, they've paid a heavy a heavy price for going against the Houthis. Uh, and I don't think that they are going to do so uh, unless the United States is one hundred percent being collaborative on it. And I don't think that th this administration uh, is going to. I mean, uh, we we are we are at an election year, but um, this administration has not changed. Its um, its stance um, because they uh, since uh, since the start they assumed that Iran is a is a country they need to collaborate with not to counter uh, despite the fact that Iran is the source of uh, of uh, the financing of different terrorist organization they thought that um, uh, that they thought that they could uh, uh, resume talks re regarding the nuclear agreements and so on uh, so so the, the, the Biden administration um, ha ha has been um, operating against uh, against uh, a, an operation that would directly tackle the Houthis, um, and 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 even now uh, that Israel is going after Hamas and Hezbollah, you can see how much the United States has been restraining Israel publicly, um, uh, and that other countries have uh, followed, especially for example the British and even the Germans recently. Uh, so. Uh, so I think it's a it's a very uh, difficult situation unless I think the Washington this time really needs to review its um, its its strategy and and see uh, as we've pointed out earlier that um, Israel is an ally that is restoring deterrence which benefits everyone in the region. Indeed, well, this is all the time that we have for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Reboa. General Gavish and Mr. Olin for all of your insights. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next edition from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. My name is uh, Doron Gavish and my background uh, 30 years of uh, serving in the Israeli Air Force. My last job I was the commander of the Israeli Air and Missile Defense uh, during the uh, introduction of the Iron Dome to the Defense of Israel. All of this allows me really to be part of the team here in uh, TV7. It is uh, super important to have uh, such a platform. Uh, we talk about the global situation, we talk about Israel and uh, those uh, different angles uh, which are relevant to the discussion.